joining us for the Monterey Bay Virtual Apprenticeship Workshop. My name is Haley Mears and I am the Workforce Development Program Manager with the Monterey Bay Economic Partnership. And this event is being co-hosted with uh, California Community Colleges and our local partners, Santa Cruz County Workforce Development Board and Monterey County Workforce Development Board. All right, let's review the agenda for today. Um, so we're gonna have some incredible speakers from LinkedIn. Uh, we have Shalini Agarwal. She is the Director of Engineering at LinkedIn, responsible for building core experiences of sales solution enterprise product. She is passionate about building great software and creating opportunities. She is a leader within LinkedIn's Reach Apprenticeship. It's a program designed to hire and train non-traditional talent to LinkedIn's engineering team. And then we have a presenter from Twilio, Vivek Nair. He is the head of the Hatch program at Twilio. Hatch is the company's software engineering apprenticeship program designed to be a bridge to a potential career in tech. Hatch helps Twilio hire and grow exceptional talent from sources that other tech companies may not be considering. And last but not least, we have the State of California Division of Apprenticeship Standards Eric Rood, who was appointed by Governor Jerry Brown as the Chief of the Department of Industrial Relations Division of Apprenticeship Standards in August 2018. Eric has served Californians the past 27 years in various roles, including seven years as the Assistant Chief Labor Commissioner. Eric currently serves as Secretary for the California Apprenticeship Council, Secretary for the Interagency Advisory Committee on Apprenticeship, and is serving as an executive board member for the National Association of State and Territorial Apprenticeship Directors. Then we'll help go into Q&A with our panelists. And we have a couple slides that uh, show some of our local apprenticeship programs in the Monterey Bay region and some resources for you all around apprenticeships. And just a few housekeeping notes, uh, especially for those of you who may have just joined us. Um, everyone is on mute. This is a webinar. Um, you can submit questions. View via the Q&A box, and we'll review those questions at the end of the presentations as we move into the Q&A with the panelists. We are recording this webinar, and we will send the presentation recording and the slides to all attendees as well. Uh, the workshop is planned for about 90 minutes with time for questions at the end. So you may be asking, why is the Monterey Bay Economic Partnership hosting this event? <clears throat> well, our workforce development initiative is focused on promoting career pathways and work-based learning opportunities in the region. Apprenticeships and work-based learning models provide people from all backgrounds with opportunities to learn new skills and um, advance in their careers and meet challenging employer needs and changing employer needs. Apprenticeships play key roles in the effort to build an equitable economy recovery in the months and years ahead. And here's a few other reasons why um, we think it's really important for industry to be aware of apprenticeships and help facilitate and foster apprenticeships in our region. And we partner not only with industry and employers, but with local colleges in the region and Bay Area Community College Consortium. I'm excited to introduce the BACC's new Regional Director of Apprenticeship, Adele Burns. This is like her fourth or fifth day on the job. She's brand new. Um, and she will serve in the region um, as a contact for apprenticeship. She's gonna be working with all of the Bay Area region's 28 community colleges, as well as employers, labor unions, and others to create alignment around and deliver on workforce training and career pathways related to apprenticeship. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Adele. Good morning, everyone. Um, it is a pleasure to be here. And um, as Haley mentioned, this full disclosure, this is day four of my role, but I'm really excited about this role. So um, as Regional Director of Apprenticeship for the Bay Area Community Colleges, um, I'm going to be helping to develop a strategy for the colleges to do more apprenticeship programs and also really importantly, partnering with folks like yourself um, companies that are considering doing an apprenticeship program. I think it's wonderful that you all are here and um, engaging in this conversation and um, learning what we can from the great panelists that are here today. Um, you're gonna hear really practical examples of apprenticeship programs and of course have um, expertise around 
the details of an apprenticeship program. So um, I'm really excited to be here and part of this conversation. And um, I will say the reason that, um, that community colleges are a part of this apprenticeship equation is because in an apprenticeship, sort of the core concept of it is that it's learn and earn, right? So you're, you're learning on the job, but there is also actually a classroom training typically portion of the apprenticeship and that's where community colleges can be a really critical partner to um, to apprenticeship programs and to employers who are considering taking on apprentices so that's kind of the lens that that i bring to the table and i hope to be a resource to some of you as you consider this and so i'm really happy to be here and um, i'll be learning alongside all of you as well and um so with that, I'm really excited to kick off our panel. So we're going to start with Shalini from LinkedIn's REACH program. So I will hand it over to her. Thank you, Adele. And thank you for your MBEP program team to invite uh, LinkedIn to share about the apprenticeship program REACH. I'm part of LinkedIn. I work as a software engineer director and uh, very passionate about the apprenticeship program. So very excited to be here. Next slide, please. So we are all in the heart of Silicon Valley, where having a tech job is the norm, and for companies to have a constant need to hire more tech workers. This trend started in the last couple of decades and will only continue to grow in the coming years. What it also started is a divide for who gets the tech job. If you are a graduate with a CS degree, it is easier to find the job. But what about the folks that are switching careers, taking a break from the workforce, or want to get back after a few years, or are the veterans? Even though companies have a huge gap in filling up their technical needs, the regular recruiting process does not welcome these non-traditional hires. The current system optimizes for results. Recruiters look for skills that are already in place, making the funnel narrow, and creating a vicious cycle. Next slide, please. So at LinkedIn, we wanted to open up the opportunity funnel for anyone with grit, passion for software engineering, strong learning potential, regardless of their background and training. We believe that top talent can come from anywhere. In 2017, we launched a pilot apprenticeship program called REACH. We changed the way we thought about attracting the talent we kept the requirements to be very basic. We made it essay-based so we could learn about the candidate as an individual. We also made it as a blind review process. So their past experiences, their background, do not account into our unconscious bias as we are reviewing them. What we saw as an output was a candidate pool that was a reflection of the greater community, well beyond the traditional CS candidates. The outcome was truly diverse not just as a diversity in demographics, but also diversity in thoughts and perspectives. Next slide, please. So over the years, we had a very successful pilot program in 2017, where we had over 500 applications and we hired 29 apprentices from that. About 80% of them converted into full-time technical roles. And I'm so proud to share that a few of them have now been promoted to senior software engineers. We learned a ton from the pilot program. First and foremost, that this alternate way of looking at the talent of hiring works. Additionally, we wanted to grow the program and wanted to accommodate more learning styles. So in 2018, we relaunched the program as a full program, not just a pilot, and we had an overwhelming response of 1,800 plus applications. Today, we work actively with our talent acquisition team and hire multiple times a year. Our long-term vision is to have recruiters look at the wider pool of candidates as a true rhythm of business. Next slide, please. So the current program as it stays today is still very true to its roots. That is opening up the opportunity for everyone across the community. We have seen candidates that have been dietitian in their previous life or a school teacher 
people that are coming back to the workforce are someone who has served our country. These people either are self-learned or went to a boot camp or a community college, just like how Adele just mentioned. The program is aimed to hire full-time software engineers in user interface, in applications engineering, mobile, and site reliability engineering. As, as part of the program, the apprentices are embedded directly into the engineering teams. They report to an engineering manager as a full-time engineer. They have a mentor assigned to them who helps them guide into their day-to-day -day work and helps them learn and grow. The aim is to learn while doing. And the program also provides a 20% learning time for apprentices to either fill in the gaps of their knowledge, learn fundamentals, or go deeper into areas that help further their understanding and overall knowledge. In the near future, we are expanding the program and doing a pilot with our artificial intelligence roles as well. And as a team, our philosophy is to continually iterate and make the program better. Next slide, please. So here is where all of you could learn from some of the best practices and key ingredients that helped us build the program uh, of this apprenticeship and successfully grow it. So first and foremost is getting the leadership support and sponsorship. For any program, it takes time and energy. We need not only people passionate about the program, but also buy-in from the leadership so that we could get help with some resources as well. Also, the buying from organization at the large is important. What we did at LinkedIn was involve engineers in the hiring process. Next was partnership and alignment with our talent acquisition team, because that's where we wanted to influence the most. So but even when we started as a REACH pilot program, we had recruiting team work with us and we leveraged their expertise to help us through the edge cases and how to think about making the candidate's experience smooth, even as they came on board. We started off very scrappy, but to truly scale, we needed the full talent acquisition support. Today, the talent acquisition team is responsible for the whole pipeline management of the apprentice candidate pool. The third important pillar is the strong human resource involvement. Apprentices are people that we hire in our teams. They need the same HR support as the rest of us, and in some cases, more. Given the different background and training of the apprentices, we needed to make sure we have managers and mentors trained to understand the differences in their learning styles and levels. Because not everybody is coming from the same four-year degree. They all have different backgrounds and different stages of their learning as they come in as an apprentice. Next slide. Here's the fun part. When we started the REACH program, we were trying to solve for the growing need for technical talent. What we found is there are way more benefits beyond just hiring great engineers. First and foremost, it makes us better leaders. Managers had to flex their muscles to work with a diverse set of candidates. Here are some verbatims that I want to share with you guys. One of them shared, it tested my own skill as a manager to set and explain things in a new way, provide feedback, and gained patience and empathy. Another one shared, I learned how to better evaluate performance and take the time to identify and address knowledge gaps. It also helps us create an inclusive team environment for everyone. Given the diversity of the candidates, they bring different tenets and different experiences to the team. Here's a quote. She brings a great deal of energy and enthusiasm to our team every day, which makes everyone happier to be at work and contributes to making our team feel more like a family. And additionally, what we found, given their different backgrounds, these apprentices also contributed in our product direction and thinking. There was one apprentice who was a recruiter in the previous life and was working on our talent product. She was able to apply her experience to help shape the nuances of the product as well. Next slide, please. So in short, I'm really proud to be part of this uh, amazing company, LinkedIn. The vision is 
to create economic opportunity for every member of the global workforce. This has empowered us to think big and create this program REACH, an apprenticeship that creates a level playing field for everyone. I'm really hoping with all of us coming together today, we can make apprenticeships a norm in the industry and help close the opportunity gap. Next slide. So if you would really like to learn more about the program, please visit us on the website careers.linkedin.com slash reach and, and learn more about the program. Uh, very excited to be here and thank you. Uh, passing it on to Vivek. Hi everyone. Uh, this is Vivek Nair from Twilio. I'm an engineering manager on our engineering education and training team. And I had the privilege of starting our Hatch uh, Software Engineering Apprenticeship Program about three years ago. And I'm here to talk to you a little, little bit more in detail about that. Next slide. Right, so a little bit about Twilio first. So Twilio powers the future of business communications. We enable phones, voice over IP, messaging, and email to be embedded into web, desktop, and mobile software. I think it's important to explain this because um, say unlike LinkedIn, it's not a product that you might have encountered in your day to day, at least not by the name Twilio, uh, but you've actually encountered it in many different ways based on our customers using Twilio to reach out to you. Next slide. So this is just a smattering of some of our customers. Um, you might see some familiar names, uh, if you have ever got a text message from say an Uber arriving to pick you up, or uh, maybe you needed a one-time password that was generated and sent to you via SMS, via Netflix, or perhaps more recently, um, the American Red Cross is using Twilio to coordinate volunteer efforts to tackle uh, the wildfires that are affecting the West Coast. So this is just an example of some of the different brands that you might be working with that might be communicating with you using Twilio um, and you might not even know about it. Um, next slide. So we have about 26 global offices at this point. Uh, so a truly global company with about 3000 plus employees at this point. Um, and one of the challenges that we have is we want our employees to represent our customer base. Because we have such a diverse and global set of people that we serve, we think it's important that our product teams also consist of people from all backgrounds. Uh, next slide. So these are some of our company's 2023 diversity and inclusion goals. So we want uh, half of our workforce to be female identifying at a global scale. And in the US, we want 30% of our folks to be uh, from underrepresented backgrounds. Uh, we limit this to just US because the US is the only area in which we can legally collect this information. And finally, perhaps this is really important. Um, we want 100% of our employees, regardless of the background, uh, to feel like they truly belong at the company with absolutely no differential between underrepresented groups and others. Next slide. So here's another statistic to share. This is based on data gathered from the Bureau of Labor Statistics and the National Science Foundation showing uh, kind of the supply versus demand graph for graduates coming from bachelor degrees, so four-year degrees, uh, and the kind of jobs that we have open. So there's a projection that through 2022, there's going to be about 80,000 jobs that may not be filled by graduates coming from four-year degree programs. So we're trying to tackle two different problems with the apprenticeship program. One, the issue of representation and the other one being the uh, lack of talent uh, or rather lack of sufficient supply of talent. Next slide. So that's where the Hatch program is born and this is the ethos of the program. So it's a six month software engineering apprenticeship for underrepresented individuals from non-traditional backgrounds. So when we look at the underrepresented angle of this, we're looking at people who identify as <clears throat> non-male, uh, ethnically, they might be Black, Latinx, or Nat Native American. 
They might be identifying as LGBTQ+, they might have uh, disabilities, or they might have served in the military before. So these are the kind of personas that we don't typically see in the software engineering context. And when we look at non-traditional backgrounds, we're looking at people who maybe have had a bootcamp certificate in software development. They might have had some community college credit. And we also include those who are self-taught. Next slide. So here's a little video that I want to share. Um, Seems silly, but I always felt like there was this job out there for me that would be perfect. I just didn't know exactly what it was. I was trying to go to school for business to open a photography studio. I was in technical sales. I worked in the wine industry. I was two years out of a divorce with a four-year-old still delivering pizza, and I knew that wasn't going to cut it. I started looking for other opportunities. I had actually been informed that at Twilio were starting an apprenticeship, so I applied as soon as I could. The Hatch program is a six-month software engineering apprenticeship, and it's aimed at non-traditional talent from underrepresented backgrounds. You don't have to have a four-year CS degree. You could have taught yourself how to code. You could have gone to boot camp. You can have some prior experience. But it's really about opening those doors to see people that we wouldn't traditionally see in the recruiting process. The first six weeks, we worked together as a small team of apprentices, and it felt like an extended boot camp where we got to work on a project together. And then the second part, we were immersed in our product teams, and it was a really great way to, to learn how engineers work together. I never felt like an intern or an apprentice from day one a uh, software engineer. Career-wise, Hatch opened a world of possibilities to me. Now I can like think about the mark I want to leave on the world. For the first time in my life, I had financial stability and a career path that allowed me to really focus on the things that I want. I feel like I have that perfect job now, which is really, really special, and Hatch provided that impact for me. I always feel like this video shares more about the program than I can ever do in a boring presentation. It shares the human story really behind Hatch. Um, so next slide. So getting back to the boring presentation. So some of the stats and figures behind the program. So we launched the program in July 2017 and we've hired about five cohorts since then. Uh, the cohort size has varied between five and nine and we've offered 35 apprenticeships since 2017 towards our goal of offering 100 by 2023. Uh, of these 35, 96% converted to full-time software engineers since we aim to convert all of our apprentices to full-time engineers. And about 92% of the people who converted are still with the still with and many of them have also been promoted. Next slide. So like I mentioned, uh, we have a goal of 100 apprenticeships by 2023, and it's been really important to get this high level goal uh, from our leadership and kind of commit to this as a company because we feel that the commitment is what leads to accountability and make sure that the business continues to invest in this program as we grow and scale. And it's not something that just gets deprioritized uh, in later years. So uh, this year, for instance, our goal is to hire a total of uh, about 13 apprentices, which is up from last year. Next slide. So it takes a village. It takes a village to run an apprenticeship program. That's for sure. It's never uh, one or two individuals. So I just want to introduce you to some of the different personas that are needed to support the program. Next slide. So first off, we got the engineering and education training team, which supports not just the Hatch Apprenticeship Program, but also the global engineering workforce. Um, so we've got uh, people who are directly involved with um, supporting apprentices in the cohort. Uh, we have people providing overall direction. We've got people uh, organizing the different trainings and working with subject matter experts. And then we've also got trainers delivering individual trainings as well. Uh, next slide. We also have our early in career team, which is our strong partners in the recruiting side of the house. They not only support Hatch, but also traditional early in career recruiting. That's the intern and new grad programs that source from undergraduate and postgrad institutions. 
Next slide. And finally, I'll talk a little bit about this later, but the uh, program's also registered with the Department of Labor, and we rely on our partners in TechSF uh, who help us with the registration process, not only for the program, but for each cohort of apprentices as well. Next slide. So again, shared a number of stats and a couple of faces, but I want to tell you a little bit about the story behind how Hatch came to be. Next slide. So this is Liz. Um, Liz Acosta actually is our first prototype of an apprentice at Twilio. This is before the Hatch program. Uh, she had just moved up from LA to SF, had just completed a software engineering bootcamp and was looking for jobs. And that's when uh, one of the managers on our, at Twilio uh, managed to get in contact with Liz, was helping her with interview prep and just uh, learning how to navigate the software engineering landscape. And we actually ended up taking a chance on Liz and hiring Liz as a software engineering one. Uh, and uh, she's been with Twilio for about five years at this point. She has grown um, and learned a lot of skills and kind of was an example of what success can look like when we hire someone from a non-traditional background. And her success during the first few years is what really fueled us deciding to build the program. So it always takes like a prototype, it takes a pilot. In this case, um, it takes a Liz to actually get the Hatch program off the ground and serve as a template on which to build our future success. Next slide. Now I want to talk a little bit about the nuts and bolts behind the program and some of the decisions we make across the logistics of the program, which might inform you in your design of your programs. Next slide. So first of all, the funding is really important. Where does the money come from? For us, it's really uh, kept at a central uh, place under our chief people of chief product officer, but then we also empower our business units to be funding the full-time positions after the apprentices complete their six month program. We don't try to slot this under corporate social responsibility or under the diversity and inclusion budget. We feel that it's really important that um, the businesses really get to own the decision of converting the apprentices to full-time and really commit from their own pockets. Next slide. So when it comes to hiring, we look at a combination of technical and professional skills. Uh, like in LinkedIn's uh, case, we do uh, essay-based hiring as well, where we ask a number of short answer questions and ask people to submit a video of, their, uh, of a technical project that they worked on. Uh, but more importantly, there's strong training for all evaluators, so all the engineering managers and uh, mentors who might be participating in the hiring process and that everything is rubric driven so that we have really tight quality control over all of the hiring decisions that are being made. Next slide. So this is just a snapshot of some of the different hiring partners that we work with. So this includes a combination of uh, coding boot camps, uh, community partners uh, in the Bay Area um, and by no means is this an exclusive set of people, but this is just a snapshot of some of the organizations that we work with. At the end of the day, anyone is welcome to apply to Hatch, but we try to reach out to specific organizations to make sure we have we are targeting as broad a base as possible. Next slide. Finally, uh, when it comes to compensation, we feel that it's really important to address this transparently. So we pay them at an hourly rate, which is on par with interns, which we, and we include certain benefits that, uh, such as health and transit, which we feel is important for apprentices, especially if they're a few years uh, into their careers and would be requiring those benefits um, in any position. Um, we, once they graduate, we uh, through the program, we make sure that the alumni are paid at, at equitable uh, rate compared to the uh, IC1, so new grad engineers, just to make sure that we don't ever create a sense of uh, two different entry level positions into our engineering workforce. We want to make sure that apprentices feel just as valued as new graduates coming into the program. Next slide. Just a little bit more about the timeline for the program. Um, so everyone 
on boards uh, for two months in the cohort model. They're working on some engineering problems that are relatively small and low risk and working together, learning how to work as a, soft, a team in a software engineering context, uh, learning how we build software at Twilio and building relationships with each other as well as their host teams. Um, then for the next four months, they go to their host teams and really build that subject matter expertise, uh, going really deep into the languages, uh, the coding languages, the systems and the services, as well as the processes that the team follows. And the goal really is to demonstrate those competencies towards the end of the program in a very independent way so that the manager really has uh, no apprehensions about converting them at to a full-time engineer at the end of the six-month program. Next slide. So what does the entire support crew look like for an apprentice? Because this is a really important part of the program. They've got the engineering education and training team. They've got the early and career team. They've got their uh, cohort leads who kind of provide more technical oversight during their two-month onboarding process. And then they've got their host team. So the engineering manager of the team that they'll eventually be reporting to, who's going to be tracking their progression towards uh, the full-time conversion. They've got the technical mentor who's really doing more of the hands-on day-to-day coding and pairing work with the apprentice and really helping sure, make sure that the apprentice is coming up to speed on the team's products and services. And then we have the luxury of assigning a Hatch alumni buddy as well, who is someone who's a true peer and can um, really help them relate to the, um, who can really relate with the experience that the apprentice is going through as well as address any imposter syndrome they might be experiencing. Next slide. So I wanna talk a little bit about registered apprenticeships next. Next. So Hatch is the first ever registered software engineering apprenticeship program in the San Francisco Bay Area. So what does this mean? Um, next slide. Uh, it means that we have registered our program with the U.S. Department of Labor, the Office of Apprenticeship, in partnership with TechSF, which is run out of the San Francisco Office of Economic and Workforce Development. We've also done a similar process for our next cohort, which is being run out of Denver, where we worked with the, uh, the Denver equivalent agency, um, to get the program registered and that end as well. So why do we go about doing this? Next slide. I think what it gives us is it gives some oversight and support systems so that we feel like we're doing this in a transparent way. There's already models uh, in place to support apprenticeships. Uh, it lets us leverage those resources. It also gives our apprentices an ombuds platform in case they have any issues to report. It lets us develop competency-based training plans to kind of formalize our training program a little bit more. Um, and then finally, um, we also get to issue apprenticeship completion certificates to our apprentices, which can hold some weight in lieu of equivalent uh, undergraduate degrees or other documentation of their experience. Next slide. So how did we go about doing this? Well, we adapted um, occupational standards for the application developer role. Uh, that's the main role that our apprenticeship targets. We went ahead and documented our training process. Uh, so at a very high level, including the skills that we expect people to exit the program having learned. And then we worked with TechSF to register our program with the Department of Labor. And this lets us, it's a fairly low overhead process uh, that lets us make sure that we are uh, staying true to the concept of apprenticeship and um, making sure our apprentices receive as much benefit as possible from this process as well. Next slide. I want to wrap up by addressing certain um, metrics about the program. Um, so let's dive right into them. Um, first off, um, this is a program that's highly recommended by the people who participate. So when we survey uh, hiring managers and the apprentices and the mentors, we find that they have an overwhelmingly positive recommendation for the program and they're likely to recommend it to their peers. And they also have a fairly high degree of confidence in the hiring process, both upfront for the apprenticeship, as well as the conversion decisions that are made at the end of the program. Next slide. 
Um, this slide is kind of talking to the efficiency of the hiring processes that we have. So unlike when we talk, think about hiring from uh, universities, uh, because we're hiring locally, we don't have to spend money on recruitment costs. We don't have to travel. We don't have to fly candidates in, and we also don't have to support people relocating because they're all typically already in the geographic area of our main offices. Now, caveat here is that um, all of this is kind of the same across the board right now due to COVID because nobody is really traveling for work or relocating. But this is representing the reality that was in place about a year ago uh, when um, people were still um, flying and relocating for work. Uh, next slide. So a little bit about our hiring volume. We get about 250 applications per hiring cycle. And so this is to fill anywhere from five to nine positions. Uh, we get a large number of candidates that we consider to be hireable based on the on-site interviews or final interviews in this case. And we've always found that everyone we extend an offer to usually signs on the spot or within a few days. And that means that we have a really efficient and tight hiring cycle where we're able to close candidates really quickly as well. Next slide. And finally, Talking about representation statistics, more than two thirds of our uh, participants in the program identify as underrepresented, more than half identify as female, which really dives back into those uh, 2023 diversity and inclusion goals that I talked about. And the bonus on top is that most of these people are coming in with a few years of software, of not software engineering apprenticeship experience, but just some other professional experience. And that really helps us because we're able to focus on their technical skill development as opposed to their overall professional skill development since they already bring some of that coming in through the door. But you know, all of these numbers tend to dehumanize the group a little bit. So if you go to the next slide, here's a snapshot of the community that we build with Hatch. Um, it's really making room for people who might otherwise feel like they don't belong in tech. And uh, this really helps us make sure that we are addressing the local community, making sure that their voices are heard, and also that the product that we build is truly representative of all the people that we serve, which is the goal of the program at the end of the day. Next slide. So thanks for your patience. It was a fairly long presentation. You can go to twilio.com slash hatch if you want to learn a bit more about the program or get in touch with me through one of these channels. Uh, Vivek at twilio.com being the easiest way to get a hold of me. Um, so next, I want to introduce uh, Eric from the uh, California Division of Apprenticeship Standards. Eric. Thank you, Vivek. That was an amazing uh, presentation. Um, I just want to just thank everyone today be, being able to join this uh, presentation. It's really exciting uh, what's happening in the world of workforce and specifically in, in the world of apprenticeship and how we really develop the next generation, uh, really meeting the, the needs of uh, we have a lot of jobs right now that cannot be filled because we don't have the, you know, the skills and uh, the training necessary to de develop folks. So uh, apprenticeship is a, is a key role in that. Uh, in 2019, California was the fifth largest economy in the world if we were a country, just to give you an idea. $3.2 trillion uh, gross domestic product. And, uh, and so uh, our, our workforce is, you know, really is churning. And we have different regions within the state of California. We have 14 economic regions and during his campaign, uh, Governor Newsom has, has really committed to developing the apprenticeship model for the state of California. And in his campaign, he has actually challenged me and our division and the labor secretary, Julie Su, to uh, expand apprenticeship to national levels. So for instance, uh, today, one out of every six registered apprentices uh, come from the state of California. And, uh, and we represent about 1.95 of uh, persons here in the United States. So, uh, so as COVID hits, uh, you know, we've seen a, a, a huge hit uh, on our workforce. And, uh, and so as a labor agency for the Labor Workforce Development Agency, we have really three priorities right now that we're really trying to focus in on. One, 
is, is the benefit aspect for those who have lost jobs and making sure that they're getting uh, assistance uh, through uh, the CARES Act that came down from the federal government uh, to really get these benefits out to uh, our, 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 our citizens here in the state of California. The second is for our essential workers to ensure that uh, that they're being protected. Uh, so with health and safety uh, measures and with uh, wage and hour protections that, that that's happening. And then the third uh, really priority is, is really is the workforce and how we're going to be responding as, as businesses start opening up um, as we come out of the lockdown and what have you. Uh, the unemployment rate uh, for July was 13.3%. We're a little higher than the national average and that's because uh, we've taken a little bit more uh, uh, more precautions uh, with, with the lockdowns. Uh, but during this time, believe it or not, registered apprenticeship is actually growing um, in, in certain weeks faster than it was this time last year. So when I came on board with the Division of Apprenticeship Standards, the state of California had about 63,000 or so registered apprentices. Uh, today, we're well over 96,000 uh, registered apprentices with a goal of reaching 500,000 registered apprentices as we move uh, into the next decade. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next slide. So in 2017, Governor Brown uh, started providing the uh, really investments, right, to how do we really develop apprenticeship. Historically in the state of California, our focus has been in uh, the traditional industries which you would think of apprenticeship, right, in the building construction, uh, in, in public service, firefighters, uh, correctional officers, uh, police officers. Uh, so a majority of our uh, uh, efforts were in specifically in these industries, but realizing the need of a lot of employers in other industries, whether it was information technology, healthcare, uh, uh, advanced manufacturing, uh, logistics, uh, and other white collar types of uh, you know positions, whether it's sales, marketing, uh, accounting, uh, across the board, apprenticeship uh, is, is a really important tool. So in 2017, I developed a new unit within the Division of Apprenticeship Standards called the Apprenticeship and Workforce Innovation Unit. Uh, the, the folks that we started bringing in uh, had different skill sets than historically the division had. Uh, we were actually recruiting folks that actually had a, a sales background and a marketing background and human resources background and really looking at how do we uh, really service uh, industries that uh, are looking at a different model to to really develop uh, talent within their workforce. Next slide, please. So one of the advantages the state of California has on our federal counterparts is that uh, we have uh, a really a team that's that's here in the state that for every one federal uh, apprenticeship expert uh, we have uh, seven here in the state of California and so um, our folks not only do they help assist in developing apprenticeship programs but they're also there on an ongoing basis to help pr uh, provide guidance in, in as, as the programs are getting up and going and, uh, and, and are there to really I call them problem solvers. So uh, at, whether you're, you're looking at just developing an, a registered apprenticeship program, uh, each apprenticeship program in the state of California also requires a local educational agency, uh, which is a little different than the federal government requirements. And this uh, requirement uh, allows for us to ensure that the curriculum that's being developed uh, meets the, the minimum you know, industry training criteria and making sure that that the, the, the work processes is is really um, going to uh, provide the skills necessary for for employers for specific occupations uh, as we move forward. Uh, over the last two years, we've also worked closer with our federal counterparts with the US Department of Labor to looking at dual registrations so that uh, employers interested uh, have the ability to actually uh, register uh, both with the with the federal and the state government uh, with the registered apprenticeship programs. Uh, this allows for funding opportunities uh, at the state of California levels uh, as we move forward. Uh, next slide. As you can see, uh, again, we're, we're currently a little over 96,000 registered apprentices. Uh, actually, that number is even higher. Uh, on our website, actually, we. Uh, uh, keep up a daily tally of, of showing how these uh, uh, how the apprenticeship program are growing. Uh, in 2008, 
2018, Governor Brown signed into law uh, Assembly Bill 235, which for the first time, the state of California recognized pre-apprenticeships. So pre-apprenticeships would be uh, pre-apprenticeships that would have some sort of linkage to state registered apprenticeship programs and allow for really pathways, really looking at ways that we could uh, ensure that we have diversity and access to our programs as we, as we move forward. Today, we have over 1,300 training programs statewide. Uh, we have, uh, out of all of our local educational agencies, which include 115 community colleges uh, and over 1,000 uh, high school districts in the state of California, uh, we have right now 300 of those are active local educational institutions that partner with us in our apprenticeship programs. Uh, the uh, other exciting area that we're really looking at is working with the governor on a task force in the area of cybersecurity. And we're looking at really bringing apprenticeship even into our universities and developing curriculum. So today we're looking at putting curriculum in all 10 of our UCs and 23 uh, uh, CSU campuses that would develop a registered apprenticeship uh, within uh, the junior year of a, you know, to, you know, to provide 2,000 hours of on-the-job training as uh, the apprentices going through uh, getting their baccalaureate degree uh, in computer science with that emphasis there in cybersecurity. And I know uh, there's just so many uh, businesses and government that have been held hostage under the cybersecurity threats. And so this would be a curriculum that's really going to be the first of its kind uh, west of the Mississippi. So we're really excited about that. And then each year we're graduating. Uh, uh, last year we graduated 8,000 or so uh, apprentices. Uh, that number also is going up. A lot of our registered apprenticeship programs vary in length uh, from anywhere from one year to uh, five or in some even six years. So a lot of our registered apprenticeship programs really, um, it's, we call it, uh, you know, college without debt, right? It's, it's at the end of that, those, these apprentices, or apprenticeships, the average um, graduates earns about $74,000 a year with our, with our certificate of completion. So we're really, you know, really developing um, high skills and talents as we move forward. Next slide. Uh, as we, uh, with our Apprenticeship and Workforce Innovation Unit, we, we've been working uh, specifically in the IT sector. I wanted to highlight a few uh, programs. Uh, we work closely with IBM on their National Apprenticeship Program. Uh, state, uh, their main uh, person is based out of Houston, Texas. We were, I was able to provide a letter of support that was uh, uh, helpful for them to receive an, an American Apprenticeship Initiative grant. And out of that grant, uh, they've uh, es established apprenticeship programs for uh, everything from mainframe administrators to application developers and software engineers. Uh, in uh, early this year, we signed the first public-private apprenticeship program for the state of California and IBM using their IBM curriculum uh, in order to develop apprenticeships uh, for our state workers as we, as, as we move forward there as well. In addition to that, it also opened up other um, relationships. Uh, in last year, I had an opportunity to go down to Rancho Bernardo in San Diego County and meet with the chief operating officer of Sony North America. And, uh, and, uh, and IBM uh, was there at that, at that um, at, at that meeting as well. And uh, they're all, a lot of these companies are part of the Consumer Technology Association. And Mike Fasulo, the COO of Sony, happened to be president of the Consumer Technology Association, which is, uh, think of the group that goes down to, uh, each year in Las Vegas to hold those large uh, convenings with, uh, uh, with elect electronics and what have you and going forward. So uh, during this convening, also looking at how do we uh, really develop talent in the local market and uh, and providing opportunities of, of access and diversity. It's very similar to uh, what Vivek was talking about as far as really getting just a diverse group of talent um, and, and accessing folks that may not have the ability to go to a four-year university and, and access and utilizing uh, the local community colleges in the San Diego region. And so we're in the process of developing right now some information technology sales positions and marketing specialist positions for them as well. 
And as you can see, uh, 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 this is a very, we have various other uh, programs that we've been working on as well in the IT sector. I, I do want to highlight uh, the San Luis Obispo partners, the SLOW partners. Uh, in 2017, they received a California Apprenticeship Initiative grant to run a boot camp uh, it, that would produce 36 re uh, apprenticeships uh, after the boot camp. Uh, the boot camp was really trying to identify how they could have a 50% gender uh, equality uh, in, into that boot camp. Uh, at the end of the boot camp, uh, the, the individuals received uh, uh, CompTIA certifications. And, uh, and then uh, the top, there was 100 that actually participated. And then the top 36 went on to work for 18 local businesses in the San Luis Obispo region. Uh, these businesses range from small businesses to large businesses, uh, really, and with having the um, County Office of Education there in San Luis Obispo being the intermediary, really, um, um, handling the registered apprenticeship program and, and then sending out these apprentices, uh, two, uh, two apprentices to 18 different in the businesses. Some of the businesses you may have, re you would recognize, like uh, Pacific Gas and Electric, uh, uh, Amazon was a part of that as well. Uh, there was also Clever Ducks, which was one of the larger advanced manufacturing um, companies there in the San Luis Obispo County. So um, a lot of great work. They actually, today, they have 18 occupations that have been registered. That program has actually grown. Uh, the second cohort went to 50 uh, apprentices. Uh, there's businesses now seeking out additional occupations and, and additional um, apprentices as they move forward there in their local economy. This is especially important because the uh, Diablo nuclear power plant is closing in 2026. So, so some of the concerns was there's, there were going to be 2,600 jobs lost in the San Luis Obispo region. Uh, which were good, high-paying jobs, and there was a concern that they needed to, to, to have uh, some additional industry needs uh, and high-paying jobs in that uh, region. So that was really the, the driving force uh, with the Slow Partners Apprenticeship Program. Next slide. Uh, we also have been working really closely uh, in the healthcare uh, world as well. Uh, we've uh, currently been working with Kaiser Permanente and Dignity Health with our partnership with uh, Service Employees International Union United Health Workers West uh, to develop uh, registered apprenticeship programs for uh, occupations such as surgical technicians, sterile processing technicians, ambulatory coders, and we're looking also one for uh, data scientists as well within that as well. Uh, Dignity Health, we've added uh, clinical lab scientists and medical coders. Uh, and we're working currently also with Sutter Health on a health facility technician. Uh, we instituted the first registered apprenticeship program in the country for an LVN to RN for our correctional uh, um, nurses uh, here in the state of California. So these are state employees that uh, and with the support of our local educational agencies and we've run right now we're on our fifth cohort here in northern california we've actually expanded it now to include southern california uh, and the riverside community college is is, is partnering uh, for uh, that that cohort next slide uh, again we have a lot of emphasis on pu the public sector there's a huge needs uh, for the state of California, we have uh, apprenticeship programs that vary from cybersecurity to uh, to help desk uh, types of uh, positions to to uh, uh, the database mainframe that we've been working with IBM on the LVN to RN. Uh, we launched last year financial services for all of our taxing agencies and agencies that have uh, the needs to. Uh, in the accounting and the payroll auditor uh, classifications and our um, and, and our budget analyst classifications. Uh, we've also really have focused also developing uh, programs for uh, our staff that are in lower uh, classifications for state service. Uh, overall, California has a very good record on diversity uh, within, within our 200 plus, 200,000 plus employees in the state of California. However, we noticed that there is an inequity for workers that are making less than $70,000. They're primarily uh, people of color, 
and women. And so we're really looking at developing incumbent worker programs that will allow those folks to be into an apprenticeship program that will get them into higher paying um, jobs through apprenticeship. Uh, we're, we have been working also with the Workforce Development Board there, there in San Joaquin County to develop really a first of its kind youth apprenticeship uh, for San Joaquin County. Uh, this is the, uh, we've developed an intermediary with the Workforce Development Board leadership, uh, the local community colleges uh, in the region, uh, several high school districts, and really looking at how we could develop registered apprenticeship for you know, 16 and 17 year olds uh, that are, um, you know, in various occupations, whether for civil service going into county jobs or into school districts and working. Uh, there's actually uh, the Ripon Unified School District and the Stockton Unified School Districts are actually going to be hiring their own students uh, to, to, to do this work in the information technology sector. Uh, Yuba County uh, is watching that very closely. And so we're, as we're uh, uh, looking at uh, the, the structure and, and, and really removing any types of uh, confusion or, or, or challenges. Uh, Yuba County, we're going to replicate that also in Yuba County and hopefully uh, this could be something that we could uh, replicate in all of our 58 counties statewide. And then finally, uh, on the civil service sector, uh, we've been working with the uh, city of Los Angeles uh, to develop a registered apprenticeship program throughout all of their various departments within the city of, uh, of Los Angeles, which is gigantic in, in nature and everything from human resources positions. Very, a lot of the standards that we developed at the state level, um, we were able to also, we had in mind also to look at uh, uh, using a lot of those standards that would really play into local government as well. So just a lot of uh, options there. And we also have been working with other cities. So the city of Kalinga, uh, we've developed a human resource uh, apprenticeship program with that as well. Next slide. Advanced Manufactures, we uh, have the world's largest winery uh, that is a, a proponent to registered apprenticeship. Uh, Mr. Gallo was actually reading uh, a New York Times article one day and read about a, an apprenticeship program for a winery in uh, the northeast up in New England in the Vermont area and uh, called up his human resources team and says we want registered apprenticeship here um, at, at Gallo Winery and that was a few about five years ago and now ENG, uh, ENJ Gallo Winery it has five registered uh, occupations uh, for uh, various uh, you know, various occupations throughout the state. Uh, they have a uh, really a fingerprint all over the world. Uh, they have vineyards that are all over uh, the country uh, and specifically in, on, in all of the wine uh, regions here in the state of California. And this apprenticeship right now allows them to really um, develop a internal staff specifically in their headquarters there in Modesto, California as well. Um, we've also developed a registered apprenticeship program for Tesla for their tool and die specialists. Next slide. City of Kalinga, let's see, uh, uh, I kind of already spoke about this, so let's go to the next slide. So the apprenticeship framework, whether it's uh, at a national level or the state level, is very similar. It's, uh, there's uh, 144 hours of recommended uh, classroom instruction. You'll hear it stated here in the state of California as related and supplemental instruction. Um, on the federal level, it may be called the related and uh, related and tech technical um, instruction, or what they call RTI, it's the same thing. It's classroom instruction that's specifically based on, 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 on learning skills that will be specific to their job. Uh, uh, there's uh, generally 2,000 hours of paid on-the-job training that's, that's also associated with that registered apprenticeship uh, framework. Uh, we have also, with Assembly Bill 235, put in uh, into our California Labor Code the ability to use a competency-based type of a program which really fits really well with the federal model and very similar to um, uh, the companies you heard earlier, um, which a lot of in the IT sector use a competency base uh, versus the traditional time based method. Um, and then, of course, within the life of the registered apprenticeship, there needs to be, uh, uh, as, as, as the apprentices are gaining skills, they need to have a progressive wage, you know, so uh, some type of um, bump within that life of that apprenticeship. Next slide. 
Uh, again, uh, what makes California a little different is that we work really closely with our local educational agencies to develop uh, uh, related supplemental instruction. Uh, instruction can be delivered in, in, in a variety of way, uh, ways there. It includes, uh, you know, in our traditional side of the house, we have gigantic training centers. And so a lot of the training is specifically, uh, you know, sponsored by uh, labor management programs or employers uh, to develop skills, i.e. Uh, in the, you know, as an electrician or a carpenter or what have you. Uh, curriculum can be delivered uh, at an adult school or it can be delivered uh, at a community college. Uh, it could be delivered uh, at, at a CSU or a UC as well. So uh, there's a lot of options. Um, and uh, depending on the type of classification you're trying to develop, uh, we can even build in uh, industry certified uh, uh, certificates built into the, into the program, apprenticeship program or even college degrees as well. So as we move forward, next slide. And what makes apprenticeship a very, you know, this is a, a work-based model that's been going on for centuries. And so to be able to uh, really uh, train individuals with a, with a trained and skilled worker is, is, is imperative as, as, the, as the apprentice is going through the program. Uh, it's really hands-on. We, we want to make sure that, uh, that the, the apprentices are being mentored as, they, as they're doing their on-the-job training. Uh, they have uh, able to ask questions, being able to learn skills, and um, combining that uh, with their classroom theory that they're learning as well. Next slide. Just giving you an example of, uh, you know, pay skills historically, again, uh, this is coming from the Bureau of Labor Statistics on uh, the information security analyst classification, kind of giving you an idea of uh, how a lot of how our uh, progressive wage scales would work. This would be a two year program where there would be uh, three increases of pay uh, between the first period and fourth period. Uh, apprentice and during that time uh, the the value is uh, you know, that uh, the apprentices will be actually uh, generating wealth and not generating debt um, as they're going as they're learning uh, a specific skill and so this example shows in, in this particular case instead of having large uh, debt uh, the, the work the actual apprentices had, would have earned 163,182 in wages over the life of that registered apprenticeship program Next slide. You know, uh, there's a lot of benefits for apprentices. I think that really the key is, is providing access and opportunity for a lot of our disadvantaged populations that um, do, do not have the luxury to go to a four-year university um, that are, are really needing to work right away, um, either as they graduate high school or even prior to high school. So uh, the opportunities for a registered apprenticeship is the ability to earn uh, while you learn. Uh, there's, again, the wage progression uh, increases as, as they're learning skills and, 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 and really learning a skill that could be transferable for a lifetime, right? So once they've learned that skill, they're, they'll be able to move forward. Uh, registered apprenticeship, uh, like I said, competitive wages. Uh, the like average wage right now, uh, annual salary of a graduate is seventy-four thousand dollars a year. So, uh, really important to get folks um, out of the low-income jobs and being able to get them into the middle class is very important. That's what the apprenticeship model does. Uh, it at the completion of the registered apprenticeship, uh, the individual receives a certificate of completion, and this this sort of certificate of completion has value. Uh, in, in California, we do require uh, to ensure that there is a, a minimum industry training criteria and there's value um, with our partners, with our local education agencies, making sure we're delivering uh, the, the, the training that's necessary uh, to go forward. So next slide. Uh, in a LinkedIn 2018 workplace learning report, 94% of employees said that they would stay at a company longer if it invested in their career development. So this goes to the, the matter of retention, and especially in the information technology sector. I've, I've met with many startup businesses over the last couple of years, and one of their biggest concerns is to being able to keep talent, right? Um, and that um, 
that the turnover rate sometimes can be quite high and costly and just the cost of recruiting. Uh, apprenticeship really provides a, a mechanism for workforce uh, development and, uh, and employees that go through a registered apprenticeship programs are more likely to, uh, to stay with that company uh, um, over the life of their career. Next, next slide. And of course, the employer benefits. Uh, it's really that recruitment and developing a, a pipeline of skilled workers. And the beauty of apprenticeship is you can actually create a ladder approach. So uh, generally, we start off with, with large companies uh, with developing incumbent workers because it's a little bit easier to start out with. But it, um, as those individuals are going from lower levels to, to, to higher levels, there's going to be a need for recruitment uh, to backfill those folks. So um, developing, you know, uh, apprenticeship opportunities within the entry level positions and, and allowing for that access is, is a huge benefit. Uh, improve productivity, um, profitability. Uh, in the United States, the U.S. Department of Labor states for every dollar invested in registered apprenticeship, uh, there's a return on an investment of $1.47. And, uh, and so it just makes sense. And that's without uh, any uh, you know, federal or state funding that comes out of registered apprenticeship, which there are opportunities for funding as well. The loyalty, the retention is, is really key, I believe, for the employers as well. Uh, the, the reduce recruitment and turnover costs, uh, again, apprenticeship really makes, makes a lot of sense. And, and then uh, the uniqueness of registered apprenticeship is, is it really can be custom customized really meet the needs of an individual employer um, and so we there's a lot of collaboration between whether it's the employer or employer association and uh, and the and the folks that are actually our our program sponsors and, and our uh, um, workforce community or apprenticeship community really looking at how do we really meet those needs of, uh, of that occupation next slide I've talked already about return investments, so $1.47 for every dollar invested. Next slide. There it is, USDOL. Next slide. So the other return on investments really from a, from a government side as well. Um, for uh, so here in the state of California, we, we have $135 million this year that's in the current budget targeted for um, registered apprenticeship. And this, these funds come and get funneled through the Chancellor's Office of the California Community Colleges. Uh, a large chunk goes through our K-12 and, um, and then um, and, and our community colleges. And then there's $15 million each year that over, over the last four years that are designated to the California Apprenticeship Initiative to really uh, provide opportunities for uh, registered apprenticeship and pre-apprenticeship opportunities as we move forward. So uh, for every $1 invested um, by the government uh, with our dollars, we see a, a return of $28. So it's pretty uh, significant when you look at the various taxes that are being paid and, and, and what have you. So it's a win-win um, both for the industry and also for the government as well. Next slide. Different funding streams. So uh, the advantages of actually being registered with both the state of California and the U.S. Department of Labor is that you can access grant opportunities for both. Um, in California, I talked about the California Apprenticeship Initiative grant. Uh, we have $15 million each year that's designed to really uh, uh, provide. It's not intended for sustainability long term, but it's there to, to help uh, offset uh, the uh, initial cost uh, of developing an apprenticeship program. Uh, we're also looking at working better also with our workforce development agencies. And within that is um, the, the funding that comes through the Workforce Innovations and Opportunities Act, our WIOA dollars that, that come through uh, our American Job Centers of California and our 45 uh, in, uh, local workforce development boards. Um, that could help offset some costs as well and also um, you know, really provide an opportunity for diversity as we move forward. Um, we also have the employment training panel. So uh, a California employers, for-profit employers pay into uh, an employment training tax. 
Uh, in 2015, the Employment Training Panel uh, reviewed and, uh, and, and, and stated that they would also fund California State Registered Apprenticeship Programs. So uh, we had $25 million that came out of the ETP for incumbent worker apprenticeship programs um, that was being funded by the Employment Training Panel. So this also is a, a source of funding that we can help assist. Uh, our, again, our apprenticeship consultants are there to really support uh, and really look at ways that they could help uh, link opportunities both with the funding side as well as uh, matching up the, the proper local educational agency as we develop apprenticeship programs moving forward. And then finally, uh, we have just the, the, the five steps in starting a registered apprenticeship. Again, it starts with the, the needs. What are the operational needs of that employer or that employer association? identifying who the educational partners are gonna be, determining the employment streams, uh, you know, where are we uh, looking at uh, uh, developing, uh, recruiting talents, uh, establishing our standards, which uh, we have a lot of standards now being developed in various industries that we have, and a lot of it may, may apply, we, it be either adopt or adapt. Uh, I think I'm stealing that from Vivek. Uh, and then, Finally, the final process is submit for approval. Uh, under state law, we're required to, to uh, uh, for all applications to post it on our website for 30 days. And then after 30 days, um, then I have the opportunity to review and sign and approve as we move forward. And with that, I'm gonna uh, leave it at that at this point in time to allow an opportunity for questions and answers. So, uh, All right, thank you so much, Eric. And to all of our presenters, um, we have some time for question and answer uh, from our uh, attendees. So I'm gonna invite you all to turn on your um, videos uh, and unmute yourself and we'll go right into our Q&A. And, um, and so if you're an attendee right now, you can submit any questions through the Q&A box. Um, and we have a couple, um, minutes to give, go through these. So the first question I think is geared a little bit more towards um, Vivek and Shalini. And the question is uh, with your organizations, um, the apprenticeships that you guys are doing, are those typically part-time positions? Do they have benefits? I think that was covered, but I just wanna make sure it's clear uh, what you guys are offering with your apprenticeship uh, positions. I can go first. On LinkedIn side of things, we actually provide benefits. These are not part-time, these are full-time roles. These are non-exempt roles um, that we created with our HR team. Um, so they, they come with benefits like regular employees as full-time employees, but they are hourly um, as non-exempt. Typically, we have a similar model. They are hourly, but they are full-time positions. So 40 hours a week is the expectation. And we don't provide all the benefits we provide to our full-time employees, um, but um, health insurance and uh, transit so they can get to and from work. And uh, those are some of the basics that we offer. Great. Um, and then another question is, um, do you guys find the need to partner with outside organizations to provide additional support for apprentices that might be beyond what your employees typically need for example, um, childcare or transportation, uh, you know, affordable housing, and that's kind of an open-ended question to the group. I can go first. Um, we haven't seen an explicit need for this based on our apprentice populations. Um, that's not to say they might not need any of these, but. Um, our budget's been fairly tight throughout the extent of running the program, and mostly we're focused on directing those towards wages for the apprentices as well as the support staff. And so we haven't been able to provide these additional resources that people might need. Um, I can share uh, how LinkedIn thinks about these. Uh, uh, like I said, we um, have apprentices operate more like a full-time employee. So when they first join, 
if they're relocating, very similar to any other new hire, we provide the relocation budget and, and any temp housing uh, as part of that relocation. Um, but there's nothing in addition um, to what a, a regular employee gets. Um, all the benefits are same. Um, and we hope that the uh, apprenticeship um, wages that we provide the, the full-time uh, um, based on their level uh, is good enough for them to take care of the things that they need to worry about as an individual. Great. Um, and then the last one I think that's geared towards um, Shalini and Vivek is um, for the programs offered, is it best for people to come in with prior experience like a coding camp or something that, that they've done if they've had no training prior to you know, applying for your apprenticeship program? Um, I can go. Um, so there doesn't, there is not a requirement uh, for somebody to have a coding boot camp or a community college. However, we do ask folks to showcase what they have done. And um, it could be self-learned, doesn't need to be through a regular course work. Um, because we are not a teaching institution, we do expect them to learn on their own. And as part of uh, the interview, or the, I would say the application um, uh, requirements, you do need to have some basic programming skills. They don't need to be proficient to be doing coding um, at a production level, like in a company, but you do need to have that ability to learn on your own, whether it is uh, guided learning or whether it is self-learning and demonstrated learning um, from the past. To just add to that, um, most of what Shalini said is also applicable to us at Twilio. The only thing to add is, um, we think of the uh, we think of the apprentices to be able to already be at have covered the zero to sixty distance on their own and we get to help them get to one hundred essentially, and so for that we might be uh, helping with supplemental learning using online learning resources. Um, there might be pairing sessions with senior engineers to learn specific concepts. Um, as well as whatever is needed for on-the-job learning, so whatever concepts they need to learn. But it's not going to be a, a purely completely structured and prescriptive learning experience. We do expect people to take advantage of the opportunity and make the most of it. Yeah, uh, I would just remind, like for the LinkedIn's program, that is this 20% of time that you get, which is paid. Um, to learn on your own. And like a regular employee, there's a reimbursement uh, stipend for learning that is available to all the apprentices as well. Great, thank you. Uh, this question is geared towards Eric. Um, what are the laws or rules surrounding having interns and apprentices working from their home offices as opposed to working in a company's uh, like official shared office space. And I'm assuming that this question kind of is, you know, in response to COVID, we're all working from home now. Yeah, so uh, as far as the state of California is concerned, uh, we're really geared our work processes for uh, flexibility. Uh, in, the, in the world of COVID-19, uh, that apprentice should have access to supervisors or, or folks or, or, or skilled and trained uh, uh, individuals to help mentor because the, the key with on the job training, whether it's performed uh, at a company office or wherever the work is being performed, um, that apprentice really needs access uh, to, to, you know, to be able to ask questions and, 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 to, and to move forward. So there's nothing that would prohibit, uh, especially in what I would call the non-traditional side. It's a little different. Uh, if you're a construction worker, you're going to be on the job site. And so the, the rules are a little different in the statutes for, for, for those individuals. But if you have, uh, if we're looking at a, a professional services oriented type of uh, apprenticeship program, uh, there is no prohibition uh, uh, for workers uh, uh, working not at, at the office per se, uh, per se, specifically in the COVID-19 world, because we're also looking at um, uh, employers, there's a presumed workers comp for employers that uh, where employees may come down with COVID uh, in the workplace. So we're, we're very sensitive to that. And, and so there's, there's flexibility. Okay, so another question just coming in. Um, so it sounds like a software engineering training program is relatively easy 
uh, to port to a remote position. So the question for Eric is, how many of these programs got canceled because of COVID? Um, for example, like construction on the job site or on the job training. And what capabilities do you see for these programs in the next year or so until <laughs> hopefully COVID is over? Great question. Ironically, my programs are growing. Uh, the need for apprentices in the construction and especially in the essential worker classification where workers have really not, you know, haven't locked down. Uh, there's a need for more apprentices uh, out in, in the building construction sites and, and, and what have you. Uh, one of the things that I'm looking at as well is a lot of these contracts have been in place, right? When you're building bridges and, and, and buildings and and highways and what have you, a lot of the contracts have already been procured. And these are two, three, four year uh, contracts. So my concern is what happens when the local governments or the state government or the feds uh, don't have funding for future contracts in future years. So I, right now, uh, you know, ask me this question to 12 months and my answer may be different. So, uh, but right now uh, we haven't actually canceled any programs. Uh, like I said, we, uh, week to week, we're very competitive to where we were uh, this time last year, as far as the number of new registered apprentices as we move forward. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, I'm just going to pitch my own question. So um, I, let's say I'm an employer. I watch this webinar. I don't know anything beyond this about apprenticeships, but I see Adele and I see Eric. And so what would you recommend is like the best first step for an employer who wants to start an apprenticeship program and work with um, the state and with the California Community Colleges? And I'll kind of let you guys tag team on this question. Great. Uh, the first thing I would look at is, uh, you know, the size of the company, you know, as far as how many apprentices are they looking at? Uh, from a community college perspective, if you know how is the training going to be delivered, the the related and supplemental instruction going to be delivered, uh, is it is it going through uh, courses that are already being offered at the local community college, or is this going to be specialized contract uh, type of training, and how many apprentices, right? So in order for it to be cost effective, you, you know we look at cohorts that could range from fifteen to thirty. Um, if you're a smaller employer, what I would recommend is, is looking at uh, employer associations uh, because that's where it really you can offset a lot of um, startup and initial costs uh, and, and utilizing a system. So that San Joaquin uh, County Office of Education uh, youth apprenticeship that we're doing is really a mechanism uh, that would allow for uh, all size of employers to participate. Uh, they, you know, we would still have a cohort of 30 or 50 or 100 uh, apprentices going through the program, but uh, we would have several employers that would actually subscribe to the overall arching uh, a, a, a agreement there within the program standards. And Adele, I'll let you jump in as well. Sure, yeah. I mean, I think the, the intent of my role, which is, I, I am new to the role, but the role itself is new. Is, um, is to be a resource in exactly that kind of situation. And so um, I encourage you to be in touch with me. My email is in the slide deck that, um, that Haley and folks will send out. Um, please be in touch with me. And my role and what I will try to do is to help connect you to the right community college and the right team within that community college to be able to start to vet a lot of those questions that, that Eric just mentioned and trying to put together like what is the related technical or related supplemental instruction that the community college can partner with you on. And um, my role is also just to help to be, um, to like demystify the process a bit and to just help out. Um, we all got a lot of great information today from, from all of the, the panelists. Um, so hopefully you took notes and you can go back to this presentation, but of course we're here to help you in those next steps. Um, and I think it's, it's not as hard as one might think. So we are, we are here to help make it as easy as possible. Yeah, and I would say uh, one of my slides it has our offices, we have offices statewide, uh, is, to, is to make a call. Uh, and we're gonna work really closely uh, with Adele and her team there in the Bay Area and, and, and as well as, uh, some of our programs may have 10, 11, 12 local educational agencies, depending on the size. So I'll give you an example. California firefighters have the largest apprenticeship program in the country, well over 10,000 registered apprentices in that one program. If they were a state, they would be the sixth 
most uh, 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 largest registered apprentices system in, in, in the country just by themselves. That's 184 individual fire departments and that's Cal Fire, but they also have 11 local educational agencies that, are, that help from San Bernardino and San Diego County down south all the way up to, to you know, up, up north in, uh, I think they go far with our local educational up to uh, well, Bay Area, a lot of the community uh, the folks there in the Bay Area, as well as uh, San Joaquin County as well, so. Great, um, and, and kind of continuing on um, with that question, and, and this could go to Adele, but I know you just started your job, so. Um, the question is, if, if you want to build an apprenticeship program with an existing program at a community college, does that mean that the curriculum needs to be re rewritten um, to include an apprenticeship into a community college existing curriculum? Um, I think it definitely depends. Um, not necessarily, though. Um, basically, the way an apprenticeship works is that you, you, know, you, you create your standard um, which is sort of the articulation of, of what is this role. You can think of it like a job description, essentially. And then in that is also like, what are the competencies and skills that somebody needs to have and sort of progressively have over the course of the apprenticeship, right? To show that they are learning, right? So um, a course at a community college could be a thing that helps somebody develop the competency to get to that next level in their apprenticeship and that doesn't necessarily mean that the course needs to be rewritten for that apprenticeship at all um, mm -hmm. now there might be as a program is developed you might realize oh we need a course for this and that would be a really good thing because that would mean community colleges are getting real-time feedback from employers about what needs to be taught so i think that um there might be moments where it needs to be adjusted, but it's definitely not a given. Mm -hmm. uh, and just generally, can you guys speak to how long does it typically take to establish a new apprenticeship program? So it really depends on the complexity of, you know, of the, really each region has a little different uh, climate uh, where you look, you know, whether it's the local, County Office of Education, whether it's the local community colleges, whether it's, you know, what is the employer looking at, you know, what classifications, how the length of the program, uh, as well as, uh, you know, is this a, a program that we can easily, you know, we've had history with, right? So we already may have established uh, uh, classifications, or is this brand new? Is this something that we're going to have to start from scratch? So uh, it really depends, uh, but uh, we, uh, depending on our programs, it can be as fast as you know a three to four month process would be really quick um our county office of education because we had so many partners and so many moving parts uh that's been close to two years but but when we're done we're going to actually have an infrastructure that uh, is going to benefit employers who don't have to worry about how i always use the analogy on a registered apprenticeship programs so a lot of employers don't have time to know the wiring uh uh, in their house as far as, uh, you know, they, they want to be able to go to a light switch and turn on the lights, right? I want an employee, um, just tell me what I need to do in, in order to do that. I don't, and so if you have an apprenticeship program that takes care of the administrative processes and uh, it, it, it tracks the on-the-job training hours, it track, you know, tracks the, uh, the, the related supplemental instruction and, and, and what have you, um, and the employer just worries about employment uh, for the most part and providing that that mentoring on the job uh, I think that those actually work out best and it, it actually would also help our small businesses right that really don't have the resources to be able to stand up a, 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 a what we call a single employer type of apprenticeship program now our larger companies it, it, you know they that have resources then yeah we can do specific uh, programs for a Sony or or, or, or you know an Amazon or you know, LinkedIn or, or Willow or, or what have you so yeah okay well thank you um, we have a couple other questions that came in I don't think we're gonna be able to get to all of them so just know we will uh, review your questions with our panelists and we'll try to send out an email answer um, to, for those questions 
Um, so I want to thank all of our panelists for joining us today. And um, everything you shared was just so insightful. I'm going to quickly just share a little bit about what we have as local apprenticeship programs right here in the Monterey Bay region. Um, so we at Cabrillo College has an information and technology apprenticeship. Um, we also have the Carpenters Training Committee for Northern California, and that's located in um, Hill. And then the, um, let's see if I get this right, it's the um, Tri-County Electrical Joint Apprenticeship is jointly administrated, administrated program by the Monterey Bay California Chapter of the National Electrical Contractors Association, that's the NECA, and the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, the IB. EW. And then um, we also have um, the um, San Benito and Santa Clara County's building trade, sheet metal workers, and Santa Cruz County um, building and construction trades council. And I know, um, Eric, that the state of California Department of Industrial Relations also has um, a feature on your website where you can search by county and industry and find a, a partnership programs in the state. So that's another way that, um, you know, if you're interested in doing a little more research or finding out what's available. And um, last but not least, we have a couple resources that we'll be sharing with our slide deck we sent out to everybody. Um, that just information to help you get started thinking about an apprenticeship program. There's even an online training course um, that's available, I believe, for free on how to implement um, registered youth and adult apprenticeship. Um, and so since we're at time, I just want to wrap up with a huge thank you to all of our panelists um, and to Ardell for joining us on your first week in the job. Um, so thank you so much to everyone for attending and um, I hope everyone has a wonderful weekend. So take care. Bye guys. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.